This is Duke University. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Verrill. I'm one of the co-directors of this conference. And behalf, on behalf of Josh Macron, my other co-director, um, I'd really like to welcome you all to the 2011 Duke Conference on Sustainable Business and Social Impact, uh, brought to you by our wonderful Fuqua Net Impact Club. Uh, it's been a mission of this Net Impact Club to try and really be all-inclusive to bring together social entrepreneurs and bankers and managers and marketers and truly highlight how issues of social impact and sustainability can and should uh, be a daily part of our professional lives. I think we've put together a program today that should do just that. Um, and I think the demographics of the people that we have coming throughout the day um, really bear that out. Uh, we're really excited to see that 50% of our registered at attendees are Fuqua students. Uh, but we also have 25 that are come from the various graduate and undergraduate schools around campus. Um, various uh, other, from um, many attendees from the other excellent business schools in the area as well, and, and a lot of uh, area professionals who are doing this in their daily lives right now. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Dean Shepard in a minute, but uh, before that, I'd like to uh, thank the many people that have made this possible today, and please bear with me because it is uh, quite a list. Um, First, I definitely want to say so much thanks to Hannah Jones and Brian Kelly for being our keynote speakers today, um, to all of our panelists and moderators for making the panels what they will be, uh, Dean Shepard for his opening remarks, the entire teams at Case and Edge for being a huge resource and a huge help, um, our wonderful club co-presidents, Jesse End and Brenda Ramaya, our great sponsors, without which we wouldn't be able to put this on, uh, especially our corporate sponsors, Newman's Own, John Deere and uh, Unilever, as well as the many clubs who saw fit to sponsor a conference like this, uh, including the Duke Consulting Club, the Marketing Club, AWIB, General Management Club, and the Healthcare Club. And I think that that support really shows that uh, what we're doing does really reach all these different sectors here. Um, and I would be completely remiss if I did not thank the, uh, our team that really put this together. Uh, Karina Hilton-Spiegel, Margaret Pulverman, Kevin Housen, Rob Krieger and Joanne Sprague, they'll be in all the panels today. So, you know, if you enjoyed it, please do thank them. Um, with, uh, and I cannot forget, I told you this was a long list, um, all the volunteers who helped out today. Uh, it, it means a lot to us and it, and it really helps uh, bring this entire thing together. Um, there was one note in the, uh, in the booklet that I wanted to note. We, at the last minute, we had to train the crowdsourcing and co corporate societal and marketing panels are flip-flopping. So the marketing panel will now start at 1 o'clock, and the crowdsourcing panel will start at 2.30. They're in the same room, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dean Shepard, and uh, I'll see you, I hope to see you all back here at 4 o'clock for the closing keynote uh, before the devils, you know, trounce the Tar Heels. So have a great day, and thank you guys. So good morning. I just have a question. Uh, who's here from Keenan Flagler? Can you put up your hands? I just want you to understand until 6.59, we're really welcome that you're here. Um, at that point, um, God bless you. Um, and, and, and actually, I, if I could, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you and use that um, to make an observation about what's wonderful, one of the many things that are wonderful about this conference. Um, I think what's most wonderful about this conference is the array of people who have chosen to come together from this campus and from the world to actually think about the fundamental issues that are at the heart of the conference. I, I think, um, you know, Duke is in theory famous for interdisciplinarity. I think, um, and it's, it's according to one of the polls, like one of the top is the top private university in the country at interdisciplinary and one of the top in the country in the world, uh, that has to imply a pretty low standard because if you think about how schools relate here, it's as bad as almost anywhere else in the world. There are a few issues that appear to galvanize the whole community of people at Duke, um, and I think the questions at the heart of this conference is one of them. Um, and I think it's really important to sort of recognize 
what I think is a profound implication of that observation, which is everyone understands that we have to address the question of what does it mean to create a sustainable economic model. Um, and we have to address it really quickly. And in order to do so, we have to bring the resources of all of the expertises that sit in a complete comprehensive university. You have to have some engineering expertise, you have to have some basic science expertise, you have to have some health expertise, you have to have some public policy expertise, you have to have some environmental expertise, you've got to have some legal expertise, and you've got to have business expertise. And it all has to fit together because it turns out the answer doesn't sit in any one of those schools, it sits at the interstices of all of them. And I think this is actually at the heart of a challenge that universities have in the 21st century. There was a time when universities were embedded in their community. If you go back to the Renaissance, for example, the, the, there were no ivy-covered walls. There were buildings that were just part of the whole city, and, the, and the, the university was part of the fabric of the place. What we've succeeded in doing since then is actually isolating universities more and more and more and more from their community. So that in a sense, what we have become is bystander critics. Um, we've become incredibly good at critical thinking. Um, but in a way, we've become very, very bad at engagement. What terrifies me about that is that we now live in a world where we simply can no longer sit beside and make casual observations about the stupid things other people are doing. We simply can't. Because we actually need the innovation and the expertise and the energy that comes from the body of people who find themselves in the university. Um, but frankly, I don't think we're doing it terribly well. And, and so one of the things I hope comes out of this conference is, uh, is a continuing acceleration of the integrative energy that's implied by the people at this conference and a continuing acceleration of the desire on the part of the student body and the faculty body and those constituents who have chosen to be here today because they think these issues are important to work together to work on these issues. Right? We haven't taken the lead and we must. And the reason we must is these are profound intellectual and applied problems that we don't know the answer to and they're only going to be answered by having the smartest and the most energetic people in all societies in the world work together on solving them. And by having them connect to the people who are actually living with it in real time, trying to figure out how to make water work, trying to figure out how to do sustainable manufacturing, trying to figure out how to use um, the, the assets of a company to actually improve the nature of the society in which the company is embedded, we, we, have to, we have to work together to make that happen. Um, and I think it's way more urgent than anyone is permitting us to acknowledge it is. Right? I've said to the entering class last year, the second year class, a phrase that went something like, if we don't get this right, our grandchildren will hate us. Right? I believe that is absolutely true. So I'd like to frame three questions for you that I hope over the course of this time, we collectively come to answer. The first is, how do we simultaneously solve the problem of continuing to bring hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and not destroy the environment? Now, it turns out that for a long time, two schools on this campus, Nicholas and Fuqua, actually took one half of that problem and actually took great glee in ignoring the other half um, and, and actually sort of throwing rocks over the wall at our sister school, right? So our students and faculty would say, you hug trees. Obviously, you'd have a point of view that says we should worry about the environment, but frankly, we're creating wealth in places that never existed before. We're creating opportunity in places that never existed before. You want us to stop? How would you like to see the world when that happens? Turns out, if you think about what would happen to this world, if the people who believe they have a better future than they have now were to come to believe they no longer do, you don't want to live in it. 
it would be really interesting to see what the streets of Alexandria and Cairo would look like if the conclusion that that body had was, our future's worse tomorrow. It's pretty interesting when they're worried about it being better tomorrow. Okay. And so we'd say, poo-poo to you. Nice technical term. <laughs> Nicholas School students, who didn't engage the business school for a long, long, long time, would say, thank you very much, but the world we're going to live in, by the time all of those people are well enough to live in it, it is a world that no one in their right mind would ever want to live in. You've got to stop. Now, it turns out they're both right. We can't stop economic growth, because if we did, this would be a terrible world to live. We also can't continue to grow the way we're presently growing, because if we do, our grandchildren will hate us. So one question I hope you address is, how do we reconcile that dilemma? Second, I think it's fair to say that the world has come to believe that the institutional structures that manage business are broken and the people that those structures are trying to manage are evil. If you take a look at the relative evaluation of professions in the world today, for the first time in history, business is below law. No offense to law. Right? And politicians. Now, I have to tell you, if you look at what people think about attorneys and politicians, that is bad news for business people. It's really bad news for business people. Essentially, society has concluded we're all evil, and all of the institutional structures designed to actually make us work more effectively are radically broken. And frankly, that's not a sustainable future. You cannot run a society if that society believes everyone who graduates from Fuqua is an evil human being. I know you, by the way. Only two or three of you are. <laughs> and for those in the audience, we graduate 445 a year. And so that's a pretty good ratio relative to what I've seen in the rest of the world lately. <laughs> we're, we're actually decent, caring human beings, but the world doesn't believe it, and we're not acting that way. So the second question I put to you is, how do we reestablish trust among the constituent groups that we need to have trust in for us to be successful? And then the third question I'd like to leave you with, I was just in India, and I had a chance to see the $1.2 billion home. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Mumbai and driven by this house. Right? It's really an interesting thing that a relatively obscene phallus comes out of the ground beside a slum with the appearance of gross indifference, tremendous appearance of gross indifference. I think that's a powder keg ready to blow. The felt disparity in this world between those who are well off and those who aren't and more important, the appearance of indifference from those who are well off is what caused every revolution that's ever happened in the history of this world. We're not far from there. Right? I think it's incumbent upon all of us to pose the question, how do we get to look more like what Edinburgh was when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations? Now, the thing I want to highlight for all of you is that Adam Smith wrote two great books, The Wealth of Nations and The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Turns out, the humanities group at Duke study the theory of moral sentiments. The business students study the wealth of nations. Adam Smith was both of those, and so too Edinburgh. Edinburgh was a society at the time when it thrived, and all of that wonderful thinking happened, that essentially concluded that business was a moral enterprise, but only if it was conducted by moral individuals, who actually understood from whence their wealth came. That if you actually make a lot of money, the reason you did is society allowed you to, and therefore it's incumbent upon you to worry about the society in which you're embedded. 
I think we've become callous in ways that Adam Smith would be embarrassed that he was associated with business schools by name. I know that the people who were in Edinburgh at the time in which they invented the modern world would be thoroughly embarrassed at the behavior they see today. And so the third question I'd like to leave you with is how do we reestablish a sense of responsibility among those of us whose moral purpose is to generate wealth? If we don't get those three things right, it may be my children that hate me, not my grandchildren. And so the purpose of this day is to me important, interdisciplinary, engaged, and profound. So if we could, let's get to the task. Anna and Dan, please come up. Thank you very much. Amazing. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Welcome, Hannah. And um, as usual, I think Blair set the table exactly the way it should be set in really connecting the point of the conversations today to the real um, urgent and critical issues that the world faces. I, I think um, all of us have a sense of really being at the, ver uh, the, the vortex of really critical challenges um, that business must define a space for um, itself um, and, and address. Um, I'm thrilled that we have Hannah Jones here uh, with us this morning from Nike. I think the great thing about having people like Hannah and Brian and many of the other panelists here is um, they have this dual character. On one hand, being people who are really in the inside of uh, large institutions, in the trenches in many ways, fighting the hard battles to take those big ideas of sustainability and economic growth and really find a way to make that real in the context of the business. At the same time, I think, from having sort of um, fashioning a worldview in the trenches, really, I think, a unique perspective uh, uh, for leadership of how we move this discussion forward, not business alone, but business in partnership with, with other players. And I think um, uh, Hannah and what Nike has done is a, a great example of a company who's really deeply engaged in these issues somewhere in the journey, not, not a, a finished product by any means, in many ways on the verge of I think yet a uh, yet a more profound transformation than what we've had in, um, uh, had seen so far. Um, I'm really excited to have you here, um, and um, have had a chance to get to know you over the last few months. And um, you know, I I was intrigued uh, as I began to research, you know, your background, hearing that you were actually a philosophy um, major, and uh, we share that sort of humanities background, asking the the big questions in a way that may be quite abstract and then spending a, a career really sort of grounding some of those challenges in the real world. Tell us a little bit about your background and, and your path from, from the kind of uh, big questions that you asked early on to the kind of role that you play today. Well, thanks, and it's great to be here, and, um, but he didn't get me a ticket for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, well, so, so I, I mean, I guess just, just briefly on myself, first of all, is if I met myself today, I wouldn't hire me. Um, <laughs> I'd be hiring you guys. Um, so that's the good news. Um, you know, uh, nobody in my family ever worked in business. Um, and I never believed I would ever work in business. I had a completely different career path set out for myself in my fantasy of when I was 13, somewhere between war journalist and... Uh, uh, campaigning activist, probably <laughs> scaling buildings with Greenpeace. Um, so, so I did a bit of that, I, I, and I did do philosophy, which is absolutely the most probably useless degree you can possibly do, and fabulous, and, mm. and grounded me well in how to have serious debates and arguments with people. Um, and then I went to the BBC, and um, you know, I actually um, started off as a pirate radio uh, when I was 17. I did a pirate radio station. Um, show, which got me into radio, which of course is the Twitter of 20 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and what I did at the BBC was I worked on what we call social action campaigns, in which we really were 
um, trying to craft a way to give young people that face serious issues the airspace to talk about the issues they cared about and then to raise awareness about some of the big issues out there at the time, which at the time, this is the 80s, was AIDS and HIV, was mass youth unemployment, serious issues of racism, um, a lot of issues around um, uh, drug abuse. Um, and so I was right in the heart of kind of trying, you know, living on Glasgow estates. We're talking about Edinburgh. I was in Glasgow Estates doing radio programs with drug addicts and things like that. And then trying to bring in the NGOs to provide the backup services to enable these young people. And it became a path, I mean, that was really my driving force was always, how does one combat inequity and how does one think about social justice issues? Um, and, and from there I went to an NGO and did that work full time um, for four years running in particular big AIDS campaigns. And the, the, the turning point for me was when I had to start going to fundraise from corporations. I'd be getting a lot of funding from foundations and things. And I very naively um, sent off about 200 letters to lots of big multinationals saying, Dear sir, I run this um, AIDS campaign. Um, would you be interested in supporting it? And one company who will, who will remain nameless forever, but they know who they are, <laughs> um, uh, sent me a note saying, uh, this is a company that works exclusively with young people, very much on TV. Uh, um, uh, sent a note back saying, uh, dear, dear ma'am, um, AIDS is not an issue for our core consumer, goodbye. And I thought, I think I need to go work in the corporate sector. Um, and it reminded me, that was a kind of, pivotal moment for me. Um, I had a very um, difficult teenage life. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, so I was a bit of a nightmare uh, rebel. And, um, and I was finding it very hard to connect to my parents, to anybody. And there was this one man who was like a grandfather to me and who was um, a real mentor to me. And one day he sat me down and he'd worked in social change all his life. And he said, Hannah, at some stage in your life, you're going to have to work out whether you are more effective shouting from the outside or whether you can affect change from the inside. Mm. And that, to me, um, was what brought me to Nike. Um, when Nike knocked on the door, it was 1998. It was at the height of the sweatshop, labor conditions issues. My friends and I would spend evenings debating anti-globalization. And then I was asked if I wanted to join Nike. and. Um, work in the uh, whole area of workers' rights. Mm. And this man had died by then, um, but he was right. For me, my pathway, I felt, was if I could be an activist from the inside, then maybe I could do something that was helpful. And so my journey at Nike began there. Um, and you have to remember, and it's so fabulous to look at you all here, um, when I joined in 1998, the words corporate responsibility didn't exist didn't exist. We were the first corporate responsibility team. My boss was the first ever vice president of corporate responsibility. Utterly unheard of. Um, and today, you guys are going to change the world because you, you are making it a core part of how you do business. Mm -hmm. So, briefly. Yeah, we've ta talked about just how ra uh, rapid that change is from the sort of uh, this being from the outside or the margin within the company um, in a kind of uh, corporate responsibility or sort of e ethical constraint on the corporation to these really moving to become central strategic issues. And I think Nike um, uh, has set a very interesting course in terms of the, the ways you position sustainability relative to the senior management and the decision making that happens at the top levels of the organization and the way that you've connected it with innovation. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, yeah. uh, I guess, also the, the history uh, and evolution of Nike's thinking about where does sustainability fit into the context of the way the business thinks about itself? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, I, and I say this and I mean it genuinely, because um, hindsight is a beautiful thing. Um, being attacked in the early 90s around issues of anti-globalization, around issues of poor working conditions, was this one of the single best things to have ever happened to this company. Um, because frankly, it gave us a very early wake-up call to what was going to become a tidal wave of change that will continue to be a massive revolution in the business community. Um, 
you know, and we went through, you know, John Elkington, who actually coined the term um, triple bottom line, and if you haven't read Cannibals with Forks, read it. Um, John Elkington um, described the five, five layers or so of um, the stages that companies tend to have to go through, um, and we're still writing that book, all of us. Uh, and the first is often um, one of um, risk and reputation uh, management, you know, oops. <laughs> We messed up, you know, think all the cases that you know. Um, and it's really very much about a reactive firefighting mode. Um, once you get past that, and it took us a while to get through that because we were extremely defensive and extremely aggressive. We, we really, um, those first early years, we did everything wrong. Um, we didn't understand what we were being accused of. We didn't accept it. Um, uh, and we, we simply added fuel to the, to the fire. Um, once you understand a little bit better, then becomes a period of time in which the company has to delve back into themselves, engaging with stakeholders, and start to learn the art of conflict resolution, of listening, and of looking back into oneself and taking responsibility. That in itself is a massive transformation culturally for a company to go through. Once you do that and you start to articulate and understand your full footprint, whether it be environmental or social, it becomes pretty much clear that um, one is going to have to really consider how you work in partnership with civil society and others, and also how you're going to have to start looking internally to changing the business processes and business systems. And I call that the business integration phase. And even as you do that, um, the epiphany that we certainly had about four years ago was, you know, it's one thing to try to retrofit the past, but actually it's way more effective to try to design the future. Um, you know, we, we collectively run business models that have externalized the true cost of doing business. We socialize the risk, we socialize the uh, impact of the environment on communities, um, and we haven't internalized that into how we think about actually the true costs of, of doing business. Um, and so once you start to realize that, you, you, know, you th start thinking about actually what I need to go into here is the space of innovation and complete new business model design. And so our journey has been that, and that's why we threw away the words corporate responsibility and introduced the words sustainable business and innovation because we needed to move out of being police and move into being the architects and the designers of the future growth strategy for Nike. Um, and we have gone from being in the office that sits behind the toilet on the left-hand side, lost at the end of campus, um, <laughs> uh, reporting into the communications function eight, 10 years ago, to I now directly report into the CEO. I sit on a team of um, eight people that together we create the long-term growth strategy of the company. I report into the CR committee of the board that Phil Knight sits on. Um, and um, we are in the corporate growth strategy and we are one of three innovation strands for how we will transform the company. Great. I, one of the things that uh, I was really struck by uh, when I was out at Nike a few weeks back was the, the just the palpable sense of how um, much creativity and innovation and commitment to really rethinking the business happens on that campus. Um, I, I know one of the things that, that you've done and really taken leadership in is trying to find a way to intervene in a meaningful, real-time way in the, inno in the innovation process, in the product development process through the considered uh, design um, index. Can you tell us a little bit about that index yeah. and how it works? Um, I, I think moving from the annual report cycle of consideration of these uh, issues to the every day, every moment, every decision kind of model yeah. is really fascinating about what you're doing. And, and, I, and I know you have some show, uh, show and tell as yeah, well. That, yeah, yeah, that would always, be great always to demonstrate show and tell. this. Um, you know, so, so, you know, I, so one thing you need to understand, about, and this is important as you think about where you go to work, is my, you know, our CEO is a designer by trade. So he lives and breathes innovation. And I think that's been, um, he, he's been a huge thought partner and catalyst for us on this one. But so, so when, I, when I took on the global role, you know, and I did a kind of audit of where were we at, 
Um, you know, and I looked at the work we were doing on the environment, and, and in essence, you know, I always think about our business model. It's a bit like, a, you know, it starts as a, some, a trickle of water, and then it becomes a stream, and then it becomes a river, and it goes out to sea, right? And, um, and, and so when you think about it, the environmental team was sitting right down at the mouth of the sea. And so up here were the designers, and they're designing the product, and then they send it to the factory, and then it comes out, and you get all these hundreds of millions of shoes, and then the team sits at the end and goes, it's not a very good shoe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit unenvironmental, and I don't like the toxic chemical that you've got in that shoe. And you're like, a dude, really? That's not a helpful comment at that moment in time. Because <laughs> guess what? It just hit the shops. Um, and this, and so, so we looked at it, and we were like, well, you know, let's just... Physically, let's just take these people and put them up here. Like, wow, that would be rocket science. But actually, it was rocket science at the time. And so we literally transposed, we ripped out the environment team, and we put them right up at the innovation and the design place. And we said, now go make it easy for designers real time as they're sitting at their sketchbooks and at their computers to design products that will deliver performance and lower the environmental impact. And so we created the Considered Index. And because Nike is a competitive place, go Duke. Uh, <laughs> because Nike is a competitive place, um, we actually have allocated points. And so um, it ends up in a scoring system, which is the, the product is either a bronze, silver, or gold um, product. Mm. And um, they, they, we've set, we set targets. So I am delighted to say, that as of this season, every single new shoe designed at Nike is meeting our minimum bronze environmental standards. Mm. And then this is a living system, so we keep updating what it means to be bronze. So what used to be silver now becomes bronze and so forth. Um, so um, what it leads to as well, and this is really important for the part of the journey that is so fun, is. Um, that we began to see that if you looked at things through constraints of sustainability when you were making product, you could um, start to deliver different types of innovation to the market that weren't just about green innovation, they were about performance innovation <coughs> as well. And we had a lot of urban myths we had to break. You know, uh, you know I think um, one of the urban myths was um, you can't win uh, an all-star game in a crunchy, hippy-dippy, tree-hugging shoe. Um, and this shoe showed that you're wrong. Um, so um, Tinker Hatfield, who's our, one of our lead designers, and, and if you're a sneakerhead, is kind of revered as the messiah, um, works every year with Michael Jordan. Plays a game. Uh, it works every year with Michael Jordan to produce the Michael Jordan shoe, which is, if you're a sneakerhead, like just the bits, right? They queue and they sleep outside like you guys did all month to get tickets. <laughs> um, and, and so Tinker goes to Michael and says, hey, Michael, this is your 23rd shoe, which is a big deal because, I don't know, I think he played, got 23 gold thing the jiggies or whatever. And he said, we're going to make it sustainable, right? <laughs> and, and Michael's like, dude, no, really, not happening because this shoe, this has got to be played on all-star game in Vegas at the time it was. And Tinker goes, look, trust me, trust me. I'm going to make you a shoe. It will not fall to bits on the court, I promise you. So this shoe, um, which, which actually is laughable, but it's actually really hard. If you think about um, the impact of like a really big basketball player mm -hmm. playing a serious game of basketball, these shoes normally have got like plating, special glues, you name it. Anyway, this shoe, um, and I'm going to pass it around, um, Bro did breakthrough um, efforts on sustainability. Um, the stitching is actually geometry that holds the shoe together. Um, there's recycled products all the way through it. Um, it was an off the charts. It was a silver or gold um, product. So you can have a look at it. We always like showing shoes around. Um, and, <laughs> and guess what? We won in the all-star game in it. And so it was important because it broke the urban myth of you can't do performance uh, and, and sustainability. Um, this is the shoe, and you can YouTube this, Steve Nash, six billion dollar man, or six million dollar man. This was a shoe we did for Steve Nash that also played in the All-Star game, and um, it's called the Trash Talk. Um, and it proved another point, um, and all my shoes prove a point. Um, 
uh, because then, then once you've proven the point, then they can go mainstream. Um, this is made entirely from waste from the factory floor. And um, one of the things that we have tried to show is that uh, being environmental and sustainable is actually something that can make my CFO really happy too. So um, if you, um, what we did is we did an audit of all the waste that is generated in the processes of making shoes from start to when it gets to the consumer. And what we worked out was that Nike um, throws something like $800 million worth on the floor in waste. So suddenly, waste got really sexy at Nike. <laughs> and it's a basic story of efficiencies, um, which is a basic story of business common sense. And so this was really simply a, um, a kind of point to everybody which goes, guess what, the gross margins on this were just unbelievable because it was made up of waste. And by the way, look how waste could be turned into gold. And it really begins the conversation about how do you start to close the loop? And how do you start to think about uh, the materials that go into your product? How do you reduce waste? But actually, how do you turn waste into gold? So um, it didn't fall to pieces, um, and it did really well in the game. And Steve Nash loved it so much that he actually did his own video for it. Mm. And finally, this one, um, which is another um, baby that came out of the Considered Index, um, all of the players that were um, playing for Nike in the World Cup in South Africa wore, um, wore their kits that were made out of recycled bottles. Um, thank you, Coke. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, we'd like more, please. <laughs> um, and so um, what was fabulous for us was to do a huge press uh, conference in London with the Brazilian team and everybody. And the players loved it because actually it was better performing, lighter, drier fit, all the rest of it. And it was taking substantial amounts of um, bottles out of landfill. And so we started to be able to articulate it to the mainstream press. And I think that's the key is how do you reposition sustainability mm -hmm. as a design concept, as a business concept, as an innovation concept? Let's just jettison the language of it's about less or it's about doing the right thing. Let's talk about how you redefine business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the trash talk is a great example of something that, first of all, is a, a great insight into the nature of the business and where there's value to be captured, but also the way to, co to communicate that to the consumer. Trash talk, something that really is going to register with people who play basketball. This is a fact of life. So taking sort of something they know and something that's got an emotional and a cultural charge and putting it against a product that demonstrates kind of this closed loop um, concept. So I think that's brilliant. Let me ask one more question before I turn it out, over to all of you. So be thinking about what questions you'd like to ask. My last question is, um, I know that you are on the verge of kind of another wave of globalizing your business and really globalizing how you go about sustainability. I'm just sort of thinking about the, the, the challenges that Blair um, identified. How do you both grow the economy and protect the environment? How do you restore trust? And how do you overcome the kind of growing gaps in economic disparity around the world? What's Nike's role as they, as they move to this next phase of glo globalization and helping to address those or, or other related issues? By next week. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, I am going to make a bold statement, which is that I think we're at the tipping point of uh, entering into an era of post-globalization. Um, I, I go to, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to go to Davos, to the World Economic Forum um, each year, and I run um, an initiative there for them um, in which we bring together CEOs um, to talk and to push on sustainable consumption. And leaving Davos um, this year, um, you know, with Egypt and Tunisia breaking out as we all sat there in Davos, um, a couple of themes come to mind um, that I think are important ones to think about what they mean for the world. Um, I think, um, you know, it is utterly clear that we have constructed a model of economic growth that is decoupled from equity. Um, and, and that there is incredible social inequity um, that creates a massive stress on the system and will ultimately lead to the Egypts of the world happening. Um, and I think that um, the internet, Twitter, Facebook, um, social media 
um, is playing out in a really interesting way uh, and, and, and exciting way. Um, secondly, you know, four years ago we did scenario planning within Nike and we brought in the natural step who, if you know the natural step, they have a theory of um, uh, something called the funnel, which basically says, you know, any good business person needs to be able to navigate the funnel of different and new constraints that occur in order to come out the other side. And we identified a number of growing constraints on business and economic growth, namely water scarcity, uh, shortage of natural resources, uh, climate disruption, uh, social inequity, all the things that, that we collectively have talked to. Um, I believe that we, at that moment in time, what was very clear, and if you had a picture of the funnel, it goes like this, along here, and then you come out this other side, which is my happy place, which is, oh, we've solved everything and everything's good and we've done it all. <laughs> Ultimately, we need to get to a place where growth is decoupled from scarce natural resources and is, um, has far more equity um, built into the fabric of how um, wealth is dispersed. Um, I am deeply concerned that for us to get there, we are going to have to, first of all, be shocked into getting there. I had hoped that we would walk in a more planned way as a collective into that new future. I no longer believe that that is going to happen. I think that the political systems of the world um, are geared to solving short-term national interests and these issues are long-term global issues. I think the failure of Copenhagen and the failure to a certain extent of Cancun, I think the failure of the US uh, to legislate a price on carbon are signals of that political failure and the absence of a strong global governance. I think that, um, how many of you have got your computers up? Okay, so when you leave here, go Google a couple of data points and mull on this. Cotton, the price of cotton has gone up by 185% in six months. The number of disruptive weather issues in the last year, go Google how many of those, you know, you can feel it, you can sense it. Look at the price of food and commodities. The UN yesterday issued its warning, which it has very rarely done, around the price of food. In 2008, before the recession, we saw food prices going up because of drought and, and water scarcity that led to riots in numerous countries. These are the signals that our system is failing us. These signals directly impact business. The cost of cotton directly impacts my gross margin. And the reason cotton is going to be is so expensive is because of the water scarcity. So you just keep following it back. People think that this externaliz externalization of environmental issues it is not going to hit. It's for, it's for later. It's for somewhere else. It is hitting and it is hitting now. And we are about to enter a time of, I think, great stress and forced change. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that our roles collectively is to be um, those that are there to enable that change when people are ready to make the wholesale transformation that will be needed. And innovation will be key. Our vision is that we will bring to market, these are just these are about less impact, but doing less bad is not the same as doing well. To do well, we need to create products that can be continuously recycled, reused, that are decoupled from the use of water, that are decoupled from fossil fuels, and that will take innovation. And so the story of sustainability today needs to be a story of radical and fast scaled innovation. Fantastic. I think that insight too, that scenario planning that we did five years ago is the reality of today. We don't realize how changed the environment we live in today is and how it's really driving business outcomes. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, it's a very unpredictable future, but we know what some of the drivers are going to be behind that. Just have a ticker tape, right? Just keep a ticker tape on your front yeah. uh, uh, computer screen. Price of oil, price of cotton, Wheat, wheat mm -hmm. and a uh, number of weather in, uh, droughts across the world. Mm -hmm. And you will be telling yourself what business tomorrow will have to face, which is we are going to have to articulate a completely new business model. Okay. 
let me turn it over to all of you. I, I know all of you have been listening intently, but we want to have as much opportunity to engage Hannah and the, the rest of the panelists. Uh, are there uh, questions or comments based on the discussion we've had so far? So one up here. Okay, I just have a quick question. You mentioned that the world needs to be shocked, and then you mentioned the weather pattern. People are dying in Australia. There is, it's, nobody has expected what's going to happen. What, what other shock do we need besides people dying? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know what's happening in Australia is a perfect example of a country that is definitely not in the developing world. It's a very developed country. Would the U.S. be ready for a shock like that, or, or what do we need to, to change our, our, you know, what do we need for a paradigm? You know, I don't know, Tom Friedman was talking um, uh, about this um, in Davos and, and he said climate change has become a four-letter word in America uh, and we will not see legislation in the US till easily 2013 or beyond. And he said absent a force of nature which will take the shape in either $200 a barrel or some awful perfect storm in America, things will not change. I, I think it's important to get a sense, you know, I've been to Copenhagen, I've been to Cancun, I work across the world. Um, I have to say, and with great love for America, which is my home, um, uh, we are the problem. <laughs> it's us. Um, it, it's us. And, and we will lose economic competitiveness. You know, this is the thing that, that, that really um, upsets me. You know, if you think about the internet revolution, because we are living a clean tech revolution, it just ain't happening here. <laughs> um, if you think about the internet revolution, the top 25 startups that became the motors of economic uh, competitiveness and innovation were out of Silicon Valley in the USA. If you think about clean tech, the top 25 companies that will be the future, most of them are not in America, they're in China and India. This is about the next wave of economic competitiveness and I, I, I cannot understand uh, the blindness that is leading us to make these kind of decisions. What I found interesting about the, the way that you've talked about these issues, and, and I think there are two really critical challenges for this audience. One is to connect the dots between the issues so we don't look at climate separate from water, separate from food, but really understand the system yeah. um, and have a compelling narrative about that. So I think it's not that there aren't shocks happening. There are. But I don't think people have a very compelling or coherent narrative about how those things get connected up. And the second is that to have a positive story about how do we move forward so that it's not just us as victims of that process but as agents in creating a different kind of world and I, and I think, think a lot key. of your example kind of points to that positive story this is the kind of audience that needs both of those that coherent story and that that sort of positive move I think it's really key because doom and gloom never gets you anywhere you know I remember doing uh, AIDS campaigns and we had a famous AIDS campaign that came out that was like this tip of an iceberg and it was really scary and it actually drove up unsafe sex behavior because <laughs> fear doesn't work, right? So you have to give people solutions at the end. Uh, and I think that increasingly amongst progressive business, there's a very clearly articulated vision of how you redefine consumption. It's not about consuming less per se. It's about consuming decoupled from natural resources. And I think the more that one can be articulating a roadmap to that future state, actually the easier it will be for people to transition there. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Uh, yes. Uh, we had Sheila Bayer here yesterday, and what was interesting about Sheila's story is that for two years in advance of the economic crisis, she was quite clear about what happened. She won the John F. Kennedy Award for courage in trying to get all of us to keep her on his hand. I think it's fair to say she failed. So my question is, I think it's the hundred million dollar question. Um, I will say that the, what was fascinating to me again at Davos was that for the first time ever uh, I heard business leaders, uh, government leaders, 
uh, civil society coming together around a common narrative of how one needs to create a different model for economic growth. It is the first time I've heard that conversation articulated outside of the kind of radical tree-huggy conversation that, that we've had. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. And I, and I really fear that human nature may be that, that sometimes we have to have things happen to us. Um, I, think, um, I think that the community has, the collective community has been somewhat fragmented. I think we don't necessarily speak a narrative that people understand. I think we have been caught up in um, the wrong discussions and that we probably need to collectively be thinking about a narrative of a future vision, of innovation, of opportunity, and of potential. Um, I think there's massive new business startup and economic opportunity in that future green economy. I think it's huge. I think the issue for us is how do you get there? Yes. Yeah, a lot. I mean, this whole, you know, if you think about Nike, and, and this relates very much to the whole issue of labor rights as well, um, you know, what we do well is we design and market, and everything else is pretty much outsourced uh, to partners around the world. And so your relationship with those partners and how you put the right carrots and sticks in place is key. You know, and I, at the end of the day, I always follow the dollar. Um, you know, a lot of people do things because they believe in the right thing to do. Even more people do things because they're paid to do it. So be it. Um, so we have, uh, both in terms of how we talk to our factories about labor conditions, how we talk to our suppliers about materials, we are actually starting to build a whole system of incentivizing the behavior we want to see and sanctioning the behavior we don't want to see. And it's all linked into the indexes, both the considered index we're actually building now a manufacturing index that will um, basically push our supply manufacturers to move to being lean, green, empowered, and equitable. So they don't just have to deliver on quality and price and on-time delivery. They also now know that their growth and their partnership with us will be dependent on how well they treat their workers, how lean they are, and how green they are. And so I think the more one can start to leverage one's power in procurement more generally, um, you can have the ripple effect. The other piece of it is we work really closely with the rest of the industry. If you walk into a factory, you see two lanes of Nike, two lanes of Addy, three lanes of Puma. So if Nike's going in and saying, I need you to be doing X, Y, or Z on this following piece on labor, and the other three aren't saying that, guess what? It ain't going to happen. So one of the reasons we've embraced transparency so strongly is that if we can be really transparent about things like our factory ratings or our factory uh, locations, it can enable collaboration. Great. I just would like to conclude with one other question. You know, we were ref uh, reflecting last night about how when we went through um, moving into these kind of jobs, there wasn't a place to go to get a degree, to get the right kind of skill sets. And these issues have really evolved um, rapidly over the last 10 years. What would your recommendations be for the kind of skill sets that students who are leaving graduate um, uh, programs like this and moving into the workforce interested in working on this, what are the kinds of things that you would really prioritize them to, to learn and really master to be uh, of most value to companies like Nike? Well, first of all, I think you're, you know, this, the kind of being able to bring together um, sustainability and business acumen is huge. It's hugely important. What I, what I would say is um, it ain't over yet, right? So the book has not been written. We're still at the frontiers of trying to understand how to do this. And, and so um, two things. One is I think you need to have courage. You need to be willing to go in and be a voice and disrupt. Sometimes that's hard. And you need to do it in a way that is respectful. You need to do it with persistence. <laughs> Think about multiple avenues. But at the heart of it, 
persistence and courage is a really key attribute in, in, in our team for how we try to show up. Um, the second is be willing to fail often, be an innovation, sit, sit as if it is an innovation. Think of this as an innovation challenge, which means fail, 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 quick, iterate, 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 learn. This is an, a domain where change is the only constant. And if you're not comfortable with change, if you're not comfortable with being a learner and reinventing yourself, reinventing your team, having to rethink how you show up, then you shouldn't go into it. But if you are, it is the journey of a lifetime. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Hannah. And I just wanted to say a quick thanks again, and Dan. That was a fascinating conversation, and really, I think, started the day off right. Um, in keeping with our sort of locally sourced theme, we had a local artist uh, design and hand print some commemorative prints to sort of uh, yeah, keep the uh, conference in mind. So we have one framed up. And just thank you so team. much. So thank you, so thank, much. You. thank you very much. Uh, and I want those the shoes back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the panels will get started around 10.15. So if you guys want to make your way over there, uh, the locations are all in the pamphlet over there. Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.